Dear Madam Speaker, dear Mr. Speaker, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this session is focused on the role of the EU in global cooperation um, of democracies uh, and uh, dependence uh, in totalitarian regimes about disinformation, security of supply chains, uh, strategic autonomy, information warfare, etc. The Russian aggression against Ukraine has highlighted the challenges of the European, uh, that the European faces. These challenges have been growing for some time. We have to admit that perhaps the majority of Europeans did not even notice them believing in positive international developments. There was a reason to believe this, particularly in 2004, after the biggest enlargement in the Union history, when, which proved to be a great success for both old and new member states. I would like to stress here that in every possible dimension, it was also a great success for Poland. Unfortunately, the end of history announced by Fukuyama was just an illusion and symptom of naivety. Not everyone in the world wants democracy, and some countries perceive the EU and its values as an enemy and actively seek to damage the Union. As it turns out, the enemies of democracy use our European values against us, in particular, freedom of expression. In the information space of the Union and the candidate countries, they spread distortions, half-truth, and often just plain lies, misinforming the public, not only in their own countries. We are exposed to a constant onslaught of fake news. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian open aggression against Ukraine generated problems that the world had not seen in decades which proved to be a serious stress test for European societies. Hostile propaganda aims to undermine faith in democracy and the European community and to interfere in electoral processes in various countries. This requires our firm response, both at the EU and national levels. At the EU level, within the European External Action Service, there is a unit dedicated to combating disinformation, EU versus disinfo. However, action is also required at the level of individual member states. We need to increase the resilience of our societies against disinformation coming from opponents of democracy who are not always located outside the Union. Supporting independent and professional journalism is of utmost importance. The public needs journalists to help them understand complex processes and deal with rapidly changing social, economic, and geopolitical developments. Moreover, we need to defend the media against external and internal pressures, for there can be no true democracy without an impartial media monitoring those in power and presenting up-to-date, truthful information objectively and reliably. Without impartial media, democracy becomes flawed and slowly dies. No country in the European Union should be a flawed democracy and follow the path of Belarus, where journalists are imprisoned. One of them is Andrzej Poczobut, a journalist of the Polish minority in Belarus, who had been repeatedly harassed by the Lukashenko regime. Unfortunately, at the beginning of February this year, he was sentenced to eight years in a maximum security prison by a regime court based on absurd charges. His only thought was that he wrote the truth. I would like to appeal for the support of the European Union Parliament um, for the release 
of Andrei Potobut and all other independent journalists imprisoned in Belarus. However, threats to freedom of expression also come from unexpected directions as not long ago. Russian oligarchs tried to harass British journalists with lawsuits, creating a so-called chilling effect among them. Such attempts to gag media and social activists strate called strategic lawsuits against public participation, SLAPP, show us that defending the media is very much needed. An anti-SLAPP directive is being worked on, but once adopted, it needs to be quickly and effectively implemented into national legislation by the national parliaments of all member states. In my opinion, in the fight against hostile propaganda, it is crucial to educate the public, namely our current and future voters, as such education should be initiated immediately among the youth. Promoting fact-checking, for example, makes the public more resilient to fake news spread often by online paid trolls or anonymous bots. This is particularly important when it comes to young people who spend a lot of time in the virtual world, are very receptive and are just learning to distinguish between lies and truth. A special responsibility in this regard lies with us, with politicians, who should conduct political discourse based on substantive arguments instead of resorting to propaganda, thus setting an example and not misleading their voters. Ladies and gentlemen, negative changes taking place in the EU neighborhood force us to take a different look at the Union's economic and trade policies, which need to be thoroughly rethought in terms of gaining independence from the supply of raw materials from authoritarian regimes. The Russian aggression against Ukraine has shown us the ramification of, um, ramifications of abandoning the values in trade relations in the name of profits. It turned out that while importing gas and oil from Russia, many EU member states for decades financed preparation for brutal, genocidal war aimed at wiping Ukraine off the map of Europe and annihilating Ukrainian national identity. We cannot allow for such attempt ever, never. A year after the attack on Ukraine, Europe, Europe has been consistently moving away from importing raw materials from Russia. Fortunately, the share of Russian oil in the EU imports has fallen from 31% before the war to 4% in December 2022. Unfortunately, there are still countries and private companies among us who see the advantages of trade with Russia. Now, the EU sanctions against Russia have been introduced. We must make every effort to make them effective and to prosecute attempts to circumvent them. Europe must not submit to blackmail by totalitarian regimes. However, replacing some suppliers with others is not simple on a global scale. This is of particular importance when it comes to rare raw materials used in modern technologies, most of which we import from the Far East. Indeed, the EU supplies only about 1% uh, of the rare raw materials for wind energy production, lithium batteries, fuel cells, and silicon photovoltaic units. The availability of these uh, rare materials is crucial to the achievement of the goals of the Paris Agreement and the implementation of the Green Deal. The Union needs a secure supply of critical raw materials, but must reduce its dependence on imports from countries that do not share European values or are simply hostile to us. Indeed, a certain solution in this regard is to move toward a circular economy, 
promoting the recycling of raw materials and raising, raising public awareness. This is the vision set forth by the European Commission in its recently published draft regulation, the Critical Raw Material Act, which is a, definitely a step in the right direction. Ladies and gentlemen, while facing challenges, the European Union should cooperate with like-minded partners, especially with democratic countries around the world. As a global democratic community, we need to support each other, as trends weakening democracy are evident globally, and authoritarian tendencies can be observed in an increasing number of countries, even in those with an established democratic tradition. The Union faces a crucial choice, and in the face of geopolitical tensions and conflicts, it must strengthen its strategic autonomy to become a stronger player on the international stage. Only in this way, together with other democratic states, can it defend its interests. In this context, it should be emphasized that the very notion of EU strategic autonomy put forward in 2016 cannot refer only to the sphere of security and defense, because today we already know that this didn't stand the test of time. Russia's aggression against Ukraine has highlighted the role of NATO, which unquestionably remains the foundation of common defense. Once again, the war has demonstrated the central role of the North Atlantic Alliance, which is gaining new members, Finland and hopefully soon Sweden. Therefore, the Union should focus on strengthening the European, European pillar of NATO, which is the basic structure protecting us from the threat of authoritarian states that is nowadays primarily from Russia's plans. I am fully convinced that the solidarity of the democratic and free world is not only a value in itself, but also a pillar that will contribute to improving our security and enhancing international influence. Thank you for your attention.